overview of lymphedema. Uh, he's an associate professor at the Ohio State University's Wexner Medical Center and a vascular medicine specialist in the cardiovascular division. So thank you, Dr. Dean, for uh, being here uh, and presenting to the SIR's uh, Resident Fellow section. Uh, we welcome and, uh, and thank you again, and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Um, and again, sorry about the delay, um, but uh, we'll, we'll get started. Now there's a stop. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm just still working on the technical difficulties. All right. So the topic of tonight is going to be an overview of lymphedema, and not just an overview, but I'd like for you to get an appreciation for some of the emerging concepts that uh, we've identified in the last uh, several years in, in reference to lymphedema. And now how do I advance? Why isn't the slide advancing here? Okay, as far as disclosures, uh, I am on the Speakers Bureau for Tactile Systems Technology, uh, makers of the FlexiTouch uh, lymphatic pump. And let's start with the working definition of lymphedema. Uh, I know it's painful, but we have to go through this obligatory information. Uh, lymphedema is the accumulation of water in proteins and tissue due to obstruction, uh, such as a secondary obstruction, or abnormal development, uh, suggesting primary uh, lymphedema. Uh, of the lymph vessels or the lymph nodes, most commonly but not, in, not exclusively involving the extremities. And uh, here's a classic example of a lower extremity involvement lymphedema. And the majority of our talk tonight is going to be regarding lower extremity lymphedema. But don't forget lymphedema can occur elsewhere. Here's a case of particularly virulent scrotal elephantiasis I see in a patient of mine with primary lymphedema. And you can even have lymphedema of the uh, conjunctivi. So again, it's not exclusively the lymph nodes or the, the, uh, the extremities. Also, remember, you can get lymphedema in the trunk, the abdomen, the pelvis, uh, chest wall as well. Now, from a pathophysiologic standpoint, uh, lymphedema occurs from one of two ways. Number one would be a mechanical insufficiency, which is the classic obstructive type or uh, dysfunctional lymphedema, and that's due to injury or impairment of the lymph vessels secondary to paralysis, obstruction, or inadequacy, inadequacy suggesting some type of primary lymphedema of the lymphatics. And we refer to this as low output lymphatic failure, and that's when a dysfunctional or obstructed terminal lymphatic vessel simply cannot process a normal lymphatic filtration. Now, what you may not be familiar with is the dynamic lymphatic insufficiency, and that's which the lymph flow exceeds the transport capacity of an intact lymphatic system, and we refer to this as high output lymphatic failure. So initially, you have an intact functional terminal lymphatic vessel, yet it simply cannot process the excess amount of lymphatic fluid. Now, who would have high output lymphatic failure? Classic example would be someone with congestive heart failure. Uh, somebody with chronic venous insufficiency. The morbidly obese patient can also often have a dynamic lymphatic insufficiency. And you can certainly have a combination of both of these uh, pathophysiologic mechanisms. And the classic example would be someone with chronic venous insufficiency because early on they have high output lymphatic failure from excessive capillary filtrate due to venous hypertension. But what happens to people with chronic venous insufficiency in the long term? They start to get uh, cellulitis, ulcerations, inflammation, and that leads to a secondary obstruction or your classic mechanical insufficiency. So again, you can certainly have a combination of both of these mechanisms. Now, the only thing I want to mention from an anatomic standpoint in reference to lower extremity would be the superficial medial lymphatic bundle. Now, why is this important? This is the dominant lower extremity lymphatic bundle. And what does it encircle? The great saphenous vein. So anything that's done to a patient's superficial medial lymphatic bundle can lead to secondary lymphedema. And so here's a great example of somebody that had their great saphenous vein excised traumatizing the superficial medial bundle, thus leading to secondary lymphedema. And it's amazing the misconception that exists with this. I'm sure some of you have seen patients that say, yeah, ever since they took my great, they took my vein out, my leg swells. So the idea being that uh, they're losing their great saphenous vein, so I have no vein, therefore I swell. What is happening is you're traumatizing the dominant lymphatic chain uh, in the process of that surgery. Um, so keep that in mind. I'm sure, again, a lot of you have probably heard that uh, same scenario. You simply damage the dominant lymphatic bundle in the lower extremities. 
uh, on more uh, pathophysiologic information. Uh, Kavi, can you hear me okay? Is everything okay? I guess that people can't answer, but uh, anyway, uh, on we, hello, yes, yeah, I can, I can hear you uh, really well. Actually, there's a little bit of an echo in the background. I'm not sure what that's from, but but, uh, but I can still hear you really well. So I, I think we're okay. Okay, and, and the slides look okay. You can you can see everything fine. Yeah, the slides look great actually. Okay, good news. Yeah, I hear the same echo. I wasn't sure what that is. It's certainly not coming on my my end, so I don't I don't know. Um, so on to uh, more. More boring pathophysiology, uh, pathophysiology with lymphedema. Uh, as you know, we have primary and secondary lymphedemas. From a primary standpoint, 90% uh, of your primary lymphedemas are due to lymphatic aplasia or hypoplasia. Um, about 10% of these primary, lymphatic, or primary lymphedemas are due to lymphatic hyperplasia, when you have big, boggy lymphatics that we also refer to as megalymphatics. And then, of course, you're familiar with uh, secondary lymphedema with some type of uh, a lymphatic obliteration or obstruction. Now, from a classification standpoint, uh, you see a patient with lymphedema, and if I were to ask you uh, a ratio of primary to secondary lymphedema, just think in your mind, what would you typically think? And I'm going to give you the traditional ratio that's out there. That is roughly 10% of the lymphedema cases you see are primary, and 90% are secondary. But with this burgeoning of lymphatic uh, genetic research that occur has occurred over the last 10 years, this whole ratio is being called into question. It's probably closer to 50 to 50. Uh, over on the right-hand side of the screen here, you can see a variety of uh, genetic mutations that underlie primary lymphedema. Uh, the third one down from the top, uh, FLT4 or VEGF R3, is the genetic mutation that underlies Milroy disease or Milroy syndrome. Uh, but again, uh, just the whole understanding of primary lymphedema has really changed in the last uh, five to ten years of this lymphatic genetic research. And it's led to this concept of the following, and this is one of these new concepts I want you to keep in mind regarding lymphedema. Secondary lymphedema, is it actually a primary disease. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, here's a study performed by Payne in 2004 where 18 women with a history of unilateral postmastectomy lymphedema underwent bilateral upper extremity lymphocentigraphy. Not surprisingly, decreased lymphatic function was identified in the lymphedematous arm, but surprisingly, in around 25% of these patients, the contralateral unaffected arm also had lymphatic abnormality, suggesting these patients had primary occult lymphedema. 2008, uh, in Feingold study, mutations within the hepatocyte growth factor and its high affinity MET receptor, this is a gene involved in lymphangiogenesis, were identified in patients with lymph lymphedema probands. These are patients with primary lymphedema. Lymphedema with intestinal lymphangiectasia, another type of primary lymphedema, but remarkably, even in a small percentage of patients, it had post-mastectomy lymphedema. So again, on to our concept of secondary lymphedema, is it a primary disease? Then Carolyn Fife at the University of Houston several years ago uh, with some of her unpublished data came up with one in four patients with ipsilateral postmastectomy lymphedema had contralateral abnormal lymphatic function as well. So how we look at this is genetically endowed variation in the regenerative response to lymphatic injury or lymphangiogenesis may increase the risk of developing post-mastectomy lymphedema. And you can obviously extrapolate this to any type of uh, situation that could conceivably lead to secondary lymphedema. It could be post-gynecologic surgery, uh, trauma, uh, stripping somebody's great saphenous vein, et cetera. Anything that impairs lymphangiogenesis can lead to secondary lymphedema. Um, and once I saw this data, it all came clear to me. I have, I have a big lymphedema practice, and I would see patients that would come in with a, a mild ankle sprain and suddenly have florid lymphedema, and that never made any sense to me at all. I mean, how can somebody that has a minor ankle sprain develop florid lymphedema? Well, more than likely, this was a subset of patient, or these, this was a patient that had primary occult lymphedema that suddenly became clinically manifest in a setting of very subtle trauma. So again, you have to keep this in mind when you're seeing patients and you sit there and say, oh, this is obvious secondary lymphedema. Some of these patients may have had an occult primary lymphedema. They're living their life on an, uh, a lymphatic thread, if you will, without symptoms, and all it takes is a minimal amount of trauma inflammation to eventuate in secondary lymphedema. 
So uh, genetic mutations can lead to both primary and secondary lymphedema we've seen. And as more and more this research goes on, I think the distinction between primary and secondary lymphedema will progressively blur. So that was our uh, new concept in regarding lymphedema number one. And now we're going to go on to uh, is it time for a new lymphedema classification scheme? And uh, this is important when you uh, when you see these patients uh, as far as again trying to classify them. And this is basically what we talked about uh, before. We're just reiterating uh, this uh, this idea of uh, secondary lymphedema is actually a primary disease. You can't simply draw a line in the sand a lot of these patients and say it's definitely primary or it's definitely secondary. I think you have to keep in mind this hybrid concept, if you will, is you've got this subset of patients out there with occult subclinical lymphedema that are susceptible to uh, clinically manifest lymphedema in the setting of trauma, inflammation, et cetera. And then this also leads to the, uh, the idea, is it time for a new lymphedema primary classification scheme? We're going to go through primary and, class, uh, and secondary classification of lymphedema. So let's start with the primary. This is the typical chart that you learn in medical school on how you classify a patient with primary lymphedema. And it's typically broken down by age of onset. As seen here, if it presents before the age of one, that's known as congenital lymphedema, typically bilateral. Uh, lymphedema precox, they have here, as you can see, the age from one to 35 years. Uh, lymphedema precox typically uh, presents in the teen years to the early 20s. And uh, more common in female, about a 10 to 21 predominance in females versus males. And this is used the unilateral. And then finally, lymphedema tarda is primary lymphedema that presents after the age of 35 to 40. And really, this is all somewhat arbitrary. It, it, the bottom line, they're primary. It doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether or not somebody presents at age 9 versus age 40. You, you still have its primary lymphedema. So uh, again, these, these breakdowns in number, in, as far as a, a age of presentation are somewhat arbitrary. So this classification scheme for primary lymphedema has been highly criticized as being excessively oversimplified. And what do I mean by that? So here's a patient that has right leg swelling with a big port wine stain. You can see the varicose veins as well. And they have a hemihypertrophy syndrome. And this particular hemihypertrophy syndrome is also often complicated by uh, lymphatic abnormalities as well. What are we dealing with? Well, this is the Klippel-Trinidase syndrome. So the Klippel-Trinidase syndrome uh, is, is a congenital uh, hemihypertrophy syndrome that often presents with lymphedema. But let's say it's a, it's a primary lymphedema, but where would you put this on this classification scheme? See, this is a traditional classification scheme you're taught, but it's overly simplified because it does not allow for recognition of specific phenotypes that the primary lymphedema, lymphedema patient can, uh, can, exhib or can exhibit. What about this patient? If you were to see this patient that has primary lymphedema that started in her lower extremities uh, at the age of 14. Uh, and as radiologists, I don't expect you to be looking at somebody's uh, can't eye a lot, but if you'll see here along the inner margin of this eyelid, you'll see an extra row of eyelashes or aberrant eyelashes, and we refer to this as dystochiasis. And the reason this is important, this is a recognized primary lymphedema syndrome, the lymphedema dystochiasis syndrome. And one of those previous gene mutations I showed you, the FOXC2 mutation actually underlies this. But again, if you saw this patient, where would you classify them on the traditional primary lymphedema scale or, or uh, schema? They don't, they don't show up. Here's my patient with scrotal lymphedema that has primary lymphedema. Where does that show up under a specific phenotype? It doesn't. Here's a patient that has a congenital lower extremity lymphedema. You can see the swollen feet and toes. And then here is their unusual uh, facial dysmorphia. Uh, what's wrong with this, this patient's face? What's wrong with their uh, trunk? Well, you can see the webbing. They have low set ears. They have some hypertelorism or their widely set eyes. And he has an elongated philtrum. Well, this is Noonan syndrome, so, which is also associated with lymphedema. So again, where would you classify this patient on the primary classification scheme that we went over? So that's why now, uh, this is a good article just published uh, two years ago in one of the genetic articles uh, stating that we really need to utilize uh, new classification schemes that specifically allow you to uh, account for these specific phenotypes that occur in primary lymphedema. And you can have phenotypic variation in age of onset, the site, 
uh, the inheritance patterns. Most of these are autosomal dominant, a uh, few are autosomal recessive, the associated clinical features, and then, of course, the genetic mutations that underlie these. Um, again, with this uh, article, um, I don't know if you're going to be wanting to look at this or not, but it is somewhat interesting, but it just allows you to break down these primary lymphedemas according to the following diagnostic categories. And what they mean by syndromic is that's somebody that has a facial dysmorphia. So you might just, next time you see somebody on the table uh, with lymphedema, I don't know, you may be doing a lymphocytogram on them, just, just take a look at them and see if they have uh, abnormal facies uh, that we are dysmorphic facies that we saw in that previous patient, what we call the lymphedema facies. Uh, systemic involvement would be uh, lymphedema that's complicated by something such as a, a uh, pericardial effusion, a pleural effusion, uh, ascites, uh, diarrhea that you see with the intestinal lymphangiectasia. That's a systemic involvement. And again, that doesn't show up on that previous scale that we all learned in medical school. Uh, disturbed limb growth or cutaneous vascular anomalies that you may see with uh, clipal trinidase syndrome, like the, the case we just got through looking at, where they actually have hypertrophy of the limb and associated vascular anomalies such as the uh, Port Weinstein, dystochiasis. And in this scheme, as you can see here, they simply break it down to presenting less than the age of one, uh, often at birth, or simply greater than one. Simple as that. Um, and what am I showing you here on this picture that's uh, suggestive of uh, a lymphedema facies? If you'll notice here along the uh, medial canthal region, or the inner surface of the eye, that's what's called an epicanthal fold, this extra fold of skin. Uh, also note that the, uh, the medial canthus is somewhat downsloping, so-called Asian eyes, if you will. And this is, again, uh, recognized as being uh, dysmorphic, uh, potentially in a lymphedema patient. And also they have a very broad-based uh, nose as well. And there's our patient we looked at uh, before that has the low set ears and the hypertelorism. And uh, this has been referred to as the lymphedema facies by a physician by the name of Opitz. Now, on to secondary lymphedema classification. Uh, not much to say here. I mean, I think all of you in here could, could easily recognize this, the uh, known secondary causes of lymphedema. But one thing I want to point out, which I'm, I'm glad to finally see, this is a 2008 reference, is finally somebody is recognizing that chronic venous insufficiency, in fact, they put it at the top of the list, is, a, is an increasingly recognized secondary cause of lymphedema. It, you just tend to it, it just you just don't see this showing up in differential diagnosis lists very often. I mean, they put the traditional surgery, filariasis, but this is a great uh, table because at least somebody is finally recognizing this uh, this um, anatomic and embryologic relationship that exists between the uh, the veins and the lymphatic vessels. And uh, but, however. Back on this classification scheme, even though I have to applaud it for including chronic venous insufficiency, it still does not list what I would consider, at least in the United States, is the most common cause of lower extremity lymphedema, at least in my practice in Ohio. Uh, here is a 2010 reference, e-medicine, up to date on the secondary causes, everything we've talked about. But the reason I show this is it's still it's uh, conspicuous for not identifying, again, what I consider the most common cause of lower extremity secondary lymphedema in the United States, especially Ohio. Bobby, uh, you have any idea what this could be? Give you a little hint here. This is what I see, unfortunately, on a weekly basis in, in Ohio, what leads to secondary I'm lymphedema. Going with obesity. Obesity, absolutely. Morbid obesity. Again, I would challenge you to pick up uh, a, an article, even a recent article on lymphedema, and see if you can find morbid obesity listed as a cause of secondary lymphedema. I mean, this patient here has, I mean, that's an incredible ca case of elephantiasis. Uh, nowhere did they have their great saphenous being stripped or had pelvic surgery, but yet they have florid lymphedema from morbid obesity. Here's some of the data on morbid obesity. You already know about a third of Americans are, uh, are, are obese. Uh, now, this is amazing. Look at this second reference here from Carolyn Fife. I, I, I spoke about her earlier at the uh, University of Texas in Houston, actually. She had an amazing study where they de-identified data from 17 U.S. wound care centers involving roughly 15,000 patients, so a staggering number of patients, 
74% of the morbidly obese patients had lower extremity lymphedema. I mean, that's an amazing statistic. And again, this, this even though I think it's just an amazing statistic, it certainly was released a little fanfare, and, it, and I don't find many people that are even aware of this fact. And then if you look at data from our institution, we actually did a retrospective analysis of patients that had elephantiasis or stage 3 lymphedema. The mean BMI was a whopping 56. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's impressive, to say the least. So again, this is uh, one of these emerging concepts I want you to keep in mind in the lymphedema patient, that it, uh, obesity, is it actually the most common cause of secondary lower extremity lymphedema? And these are some examples of uh, patients that, again, unfortunately, much to my chagrin, I see on a weekly basis. What do they all have in common? It's not pelvic surgery. It's not uh, removal of their great saphenous vein. I mean, this patient, look at this last patient here. They are so big. This is a 500-pounder that he had to be wheeled in on a stretcher because he could not walk. And again, what, all of these patients have uh, elephantiasis uh, or stage 3 lymphedema. Now, that begets the question, why does obesity cause lymphedema? And the bottom line is nobody really knows. Uh, from a simplistic uh, standpoint, probably the most uh, likely reason would be simple structural lymphatic changes uh, in the interstitium from the, uh, the massively obese tissue, uh, impaired diaphragmatic, mo diaphragmatic movement, and increased abdominal pressure that uh, could occur, which could lead to impairment of the thoracic duct in the, uh, the abdominal pelvic lymphatics. Maybe that's responsible for it. Uh, arteriovenous proliferation within oxygen demand fat tissue without proportional lymphatic proliferation. Possibly that's responsible. No doubt, and this, this is, has been shown, the patient that's morbidly obese has increased circulating plasma volume and interstitial fluid. So one mechanism may be that this increased plasma volume over a period of time leads to the dynamic high output failure lymphatic insufficiency we previously referenced, which overloads that, lymph, that, uh, that terminal lymphatic that leads to secondary lymphedema. And then finally, the adipocyte, as you know, is a uh, a cell that uh, has inflammatory properties and maybe the chronic inflammation with uh, uh, a lot of adipocytes is what leads to lymphedema. Again, nobody knows. Uh, it could be a combination of, uh, of all of these. Now, uh, again, keeping with our theme of emerging concepts, I think this is a very interesting concept. Uh, if you were to see this patient uh, that comes in with a, and they've had recurrent episodes, they have lymphedema, and they've had recurrent episodes of this problem, what would you say is the most likely etiology of their lymphedema? What are we looking at here? Looking at a red, hot, swollen leg. So you'd say, well, this looks like a cellulitis or an erysipelas, and you would be right. And so you're probably thinking that the recurrent cellulitis is what has ultimately led to uh, lymphangiothrombosis and destruction of their lymphatic vessels, thus leading to lymphedema. However, it may not be that simple. And here are two incredible studies that were published back-to-back -back in the British Journal of Dermatology in 2008, where patients with a first-time index episode of unilateral erysipelas or cellulitis uh, underwent bilateral lower extremity lymphocentigraphy. In none of these patients did they initially have clinically manifest lymphedema. Uh, you'll see in the first study, in 80% of the patients with an abnormal scan of the affected limb, which you would expect if, if you're working under the hypothesis that recurrent cellulitis leads to lymphedema, lymphatic abnormalities were detected in the normal contralateral limb as well. Same thing in the uh, second study, almost identical findings. An abnormal scan was identified in 87% of the patients ipsilaterally, but in 62% of the patients, the scan was abnormal bilaterally. So what does that tell you? We, we basically have one of these chicken or egg scenarios that a lot of these patients, in fact, uh, the majority of the patients that present with cellulitis erysipelas have pre-existing subclinical or occult primary lymphedema, which predisposes them to developing soft tissue infection. That's why these patients are getting recurrent cellulitis. It's not because the recurrent cellulitis leads to lymphedema. They already had clinically occult or, or, or occult lymphedema, which became clinically manifest in the setting of that index episode of cellulitis. So the teaching point is cellulitis is more often a marker rather than a cause of lymphedema. 
So I'd like to just change your thinking on this, this whole concept of the relationship between lymphedema and infection. So how do we make the diagnosis of lymphedema? When the majority of patients with lymphedema, the diagnosis can be made with an adequate history and physical examination. However, if the diagnosis is unclear, uh, we have lymphocentigraphy, CT, MRI, or lymphangiography. It's interesting, and I'm sure a lot of you are, are, are quite familiar with some of the data out there on utilizing CT or MR uh, for diagnosing lymphedema. I still have yet to see any radiologist at any institution I've ever worked at that can, you can order an MRI and they say, oh yeah, that's consistent with lymphedema. I just don't find that to be practical, I think, and I think that's more of a, uh, uh, it's just, it may be institutional uh, uh, driven and quite limited in its scope. So really lymphocentigraphy is the, uh, the easiest way and I think the most widely available way to help you out in, in making the diagnosis if you're unclear. Uh, I probably order just as many lymphocentigrams uh, to disprove the diagnosis of lymphedema because I have a large population of patients referred to me for swelling that come in and they are convinced, they've been told by three different examiners, you have lymphedema and I look at them and there's no lymphedema whatsoever. So sometimes you have to go as far as ordering a lymphocentigram just to disprove the diagnosis. But uh, if the diagnosis is in question, uh, sometimes uh, uh, limb swelling is not obvious uh, lymphedema, the lymphocentigram can be quite helpful. Uh, lymphangiography, I've seen one performed in the last 17 years, um, so uh, I, I doubt many of you are performing that. It's typically reserved for uh, uh, if, let's say, a lymphovenous bypass surgery is going to be considered or some type of lympholymphatic bypass, uh, uh, you may see that uh, ordered. So really, lymphedema's uh, diagnosis is all about the physical examination. So let's go through some of the salient physical examination features. If you were to see this patient on your table, and hopefully nobody would send this patient in for you to undergo, <laughs> undergo a lymphocentigram because the diagnosis is obvious and good luck sticking uh, the, uh, the needles between those toes. Uh, but anyway, what's, uh, what's characteristic of lymphedema on this patient's uh, extremity? Well, first of all, we see the prominent dorsal pedal swelling, the so-called buffalo hump, if you will. That's very characteristic of lymphedema. Nothing else looks like that. Uh, that's a that's a dorsal pedal prominence that you see with lymphedema. It's quite classic. So if you see that, you don't need a lymphocentigram to make the diagnosis. If you were to see this patient, look at this buffalo hump. I mean, that's uh, that's huge. Uh, again, you don't need a lymphocentigram to make the diagnosis. That's obvious lymphedema. Now you're probably wondering why is the uh, the buffalo hump or the dorsal pedal prominence purple? Well, that's because they were sent in by an infectious disease uh, specialist, and this was chronically ulcerating and, and quite mephitic, and they were placing um, uh, gentian violet on this to control the smell as well as the infection. Uh, but again, very, very obvious case of, uh, of lymphedema. Here's our buffalo hump again. Now, what is characteristic of lymphedema on this examination? So anytime, let's say you're doing a lymphocentigram, I'd encourage you to look, at, look for this potential finding on a lymphedema patient. What do we see? A couple of things here are very characteristic of lymphedema. Well, first and foremost, the toes are swollen. Uh, in fact, the majority of lymphedema you see in the upper lower extremity, it should be, ma it should be uh, manifested by distal swelling. That is, the hand and fingers or the toes and feet should swell. Uh, there's a rare exception we're going to go over, but as a whole, patients that have lymphedema, typically that swelling begins distally. So we have swelling in the toes, number one. Number two, a very uh, important finding here is, and this is characteristic of primary lymphedema, what do you notice about the nails that's not normal? These are very hypoplastic appearing nails, very small nails, and you'll see this in primary lymphedema. This is not a, a manifestation of secondary lymphedema, this is primary lymphedema. Well, this is very helpful. If you were to see this in a patient that comes in the age of 35 and suddenly develops what you think is lymphedema, and you see toenails that look like this, they've got primary lymphedema. One more feature of these nails that's quite characteristic of primary lymphedema, I'm going to give you a lateral view to help you out here. What do you think about that? 
So not only are they hyperplastic, you also see this concavity in the nail. That's not normal either. You don't see this typically with secondary lymphedema. This is primary lymphedema, and these are often referred to as ski jump nails. So again, this is very helpful on examination. If you see this, you've made the diagnosis of primary lymphedema. You've got hypoplastic appearing concave nails, also known as ski jump nails. And I just love showing this for shock value. Uh, uh, do you really think you would need a lymphocytogram on this patient to make the diagnosis? I mean, this is truly the mother of all buffalo humps. I mean, that, that's absolutely incredible. Um, and if you had to use an analogy, compare this to a Starbucks coffee size, this would clearly be a trenta size buffalo hump, if you will. I mean, that that is really a grotesque, to say the least. <laughs> Uh, one more feature that was evident on the last slide, not the, not the, uh, the mother ball buffalo hump slide, but the one before that. One more feature here I want you to, uh, to recognize as being uh, diagnostic of lymphedema. What? And uh, we've already talked about the swelling. Uh, these are actually onico, uh, gryphotic, and mycotic toes. But anything else here you see that's uh, suggestive of lymphedema? Sausage toes, which we've talked about, but the exaggerated skin creases is what I want you to recognize. When you see these markedly deep fissures in the proximal dorsal portion of the toes or anywhere along the dorsa of the toes, uh, that's suggestive of lymphedema. So again, uh, you, you typically don't need uh, uh, lymphocytography to make this diagnosis. Exaggerated skin creases. Also, the pewty orange appearance. Look closely, especially along the the distal dorsal forearm and the proximal dorsal hand. Do you see that sort of a very minimal verrucous appearance? And we'll get you a close up there. This is the pewty orange appearance. When you see a pewty orange appearance, that is reflective of dermal lymphatic hypertension uh, and or infiltration. There's something infiltrating the dermal lymphatics, and that suggests lymphedema. Great example of a, and look at this. This is actually along the lateral, proximal lateral portion of a patient's thigh. She was morbidly obese to say the least, but a great example of a pewty orange appearance, uh, suggestive of lymphedema. Now, sometimes when you see lymphedema patients, you'll see stimmer sign documented. And what is stimmer sign? Well, this is named after the late venologist uh, Robert Stimmer. And the stimmer sign is defined as an inability or failure to pinch or pick up a fold of skin at the base of the second toe. It's positive in lymphedema, and it's negative in lip edema. We'll go through lip edema in just a couple of slides here. Um, so rest assured, if you were to see this patient and you tried to pinch the base of their second toe, uh, that's going to be a markedly positive stimmer sign. No way are you going to be able to pinch that. Now, in contradistinction to this patient, It'd be quite easy to pinch their uh, the base of their second toe. Now, uh, for some reason, I see a lot more of the uh, the former than I do of the latter patients here, unfortunately. But uh, now, one thing you have to keep in mind is the stimmer sign is not an absolute. That is, you can have patients with early lymphedema that has not been complicated by cutaneous fibrosis, and you can still pinch the base of their second toe. So it's it's not an absolute. Early lymphedema, you can still have a negative stimmer sign. Positive, though, it's definitely late. Now, like we talked about earlier, I stated that lymphedema classically has acral swelling, uh, be it the, uh, the foot uh, or the toes or the hand or the fingers. So if I were to show you this patient, and they come in and they have left leg swelling, as you can see here, it's all the way up in the, uh, the thigh. Uh, look at the proximal calf, look at the ankle. But now I'm showing you a close-up of the foot, and you don't see a buffalo hump there. You don't see exaggerated skin creases. And then I would ask you, does this patient have lymphedema? Is that possible? Well, yes, it is, is, is the correct answer. This poor guy actually went in for a, uh, he was supposed to have some type of complicated uh, hernia surgery, and they go in and find a sarcoma in his lumbar region. So they had to resect the sarcoma, all his lymph nodes, and then he develops this type of swelling. And by the way, he has no DVT. So what can happen, uh, at least early on, when you have patients that, under have, that undergo some type of proximal lymph node surgery, you can have the phenomenon of what's called foot sparing. And this also uh, analogous uh, to what can happen in the upper extremities where patients that undergo post-mastectomy 
or, or under, have post be lymphedema, they can actually have hand or finger sparing. So when the obstruction is proximal early on, you can just have proximal lymphedema that spares the aqua portion of the extremities. Now, as time goes on, uh, the lymphatics fail distally and lead to incompetence all the way down to foot and toes. You could develop your, your characteristic swelling. But uh, don't be so dogmatic as to say this patient cannot have lymphedema because they don't have foot or toe swelling. That's not true. You can have the, the variant uh, called foot sparing. So if we see a patient with lymphedema, uh, how do we stage these patients? Now, uh, this is the most commonly used staging criteria. It's, uh, it, was, it actually was originally developed by the World Health Organization, um, and this is out of the uh, been updated now in the internet by the International Society of Lymphology. They used to just have three stages, all clinical stages, one, two, and three, and now they've added this stage zero, which like we've talked about, there's probably a lot of stage zero patients out there that just simply have occult lymphedema, where if you were to do uh, lymphocentigrity on these patients, you'd see it's markedly abnormal, but yet they have no visible uh, clinical lymphedema. And then we're going to go through our, our clinical stages here of one, two, and three, where you can actually see clinical lymphedema. But this is by far the most commonly used uh, staging criteria. So what is stage one lymphedema? Well, not surprisingly, this is uh, mild lymphedema. Uh, the tissues are soft and they're often pitting. A lot of times we're taught in medical school that lymphedema never pits. Well, that's not true. Early lymphedema, which has not been complicated by cutaneous or subcutaneous fibrosis, can still easily pit. And then what's also unique about the stage one lymphedema patient is that swelling should be completely relieved with elevation uh, overnight. So there's our stage one lymphedema. Now let's move on to stage two lymphedema. A lot of times you'll see stage two lymphedema broken down into two stages. There's an early stage two, which still tends to pit, but then you have a late stage two where fibrosis within the skin or subcutaneous tissues has, uh, has manifested. And so now you start to get the classic uh, minimal to non-pitting edema that you think of when, when you think of lymphedema. And you start to get skin changes such as hyperkeratosis, maybe a little bit of hyperpigmentation, and in contrast with the stage two patient, the swelling never is, is not completely relieved with elevation. You may have some relief. I mean, almost all swelling when you when you elevate the limb, you have some improvement. Uh, but but an early stage two, which still pitch, you might say, well, what distinguishes that from a stage one? It's the fact that it does not completely go away overnight with elevation. And there's a case of uh, stage two lymphedema. And then finally, the worst stage of lymphedema, which we refer to as elephantiasis, this is a constellation of disfiguring cutaneous changes where you have severe, clearly non-pitting edema. This is marked fibrosis. There's no way this is going to pit. Uh, it's hyperkeratotic. Um, it's indurated. You see nodules, even big tumor-like nodules. You get the phenomenon of cobblestoning. And you can even get ulcerations with elephantiasis. A lot of times we're taught uh, lymphedema in contrast to chronic venous insufficiency, never ulcerates. Well, that is not true. Anybody that sees elephantiasis will tell you that you can get very, very foul-smelling uh, uh, ulcerations with the, the elephantiasis patient. Now, um, I'm showing you a picture of a uh, an Italian street. You're probably wondering what in the world does this have to do with lymphedema? Uh, specifically, what does it have to do with elephantiasis, which, by the way, we refer to in um, uh, European countries in America, uh, elephantiasis nostris varicosis, or ENV. Well, what we're showing you here is a cobbled stone appearance. And here's a great example of a patient that has elephantiasis. And look at his medial thigh and look at all the cobblestoning. I'll give you a close-up here. So, if, again, if you were to see this, uh, don't let anybody make you uh, do a lymphocentigrity, I'm going to say, because it, it's not necessary. I mean, obviously, this patient has elephantiasis. Cobblestoning is classic of elephantiasis. And this is just one sheet-like collection of nodules, one giant plaque, if you will. Um, and again, like I said earlier, uh, sometimes you're taught uh, elephant or, or you're taught that lymphedema never ulcerates. So I'm giving you two great examples of lymphedema, actually stage three lymphedema or elephantiasis, where you have huge foul-smelling ulcerations. I mean, these are these are uh, these are terrible smelling if you ever have the misfortune of uh, treating them. Um, now, back to, let's just break down this term, because you'll see this uh, sometimes, ENV or elephantiasis, nostris varicosis. Well, let's just break that down. Elephantiasis, you know what that is. It's a disfiguring cutaneous changes. Nostris is really a, from the Latin term meaning from our or our temperate environment, and that's to 
contrast it with the classic elephantiasis tropicalis that you you all remember with with uh, a filariasis infection. So nostris meaning from our temperate region, and then finally varicosa meaning wart-like. So uh, it's a handful to say, but just uh, just remember E and V, and and the word the, the term all makes sense when you, when you break it down. Uh, continuing with our uh, our concept of E and V, I'm showing you this picture here because some of the synonyms you'll see for E and V are lymphostatic varicosa or mossy leg or mossy foot. And if you were to look at that photo, that really does look like a mossy leg. And again, what do you see? You see more cobblestone in there, a lot of cutaneous fibrosis. So another a good example of E and V. Uh, what causes elephantiasis. Well, the traditional teaching has always been its recurrent streptococcal cellulitis and lymphangitis, but I would submit to you that in the United States, obesity has to be under their under etiology as well. I have never seen elephantiasis in the United States um, rise in, the, in a non-obese person. Never seen it. And I, I'm, it's probably out there, but I certainly have never seen it. So how do you treat it? Treat infection and control edema and most importantly, lose weight. Back to the study that I referenced earlier on elephantiasis. We actually uh, have the largest series on elephantiasis, which is only 21 cases, which is not saying much. But yet when you look what's out there, all the other data just looks at three or fewer patients in these, uh, in these case series. So we looked at some of the uh, demographic features and variables that are associated with ENV uh, via a retrospective uh, chart review. Um, all 21 of these patients were obese. So again, back to this link between morbid obesity and elephantiasis, 91% were morbidly obese. And the mean BMI, again, a whopping 56, ranging anywhere from 35 up to 79. These were big calves. A, a very important point of this study was that 71% of our patients with elephantiasis had concurrent chronic venous insufficiency. And that was either by clinical examination or actually via ultrasonography. So. Uh, um, again, underlying this relationship between chronic venous insufficiency and lymphedema. Again, the two go hand in hand, especially in the morbidly obese patient. I mean, more, as you know, morbid obesity is a risk factor for chronic venous insufficiency. So I don't think it's surprising that we're finding both of these uh, um, entities in the morbidly obese patient. Uh, they were bi it was primarily bilateral. And like the previous literature out there, 86% uh, of these patients had uh, either active or a prior history of a soft tissue infection. So when you think of elephantiasis in the United States, the United States think morbid obesity. And again, if you ever see a case of this in a non-obese patient, please take a photograph of it and send it to me because I want to see it. Uh, I know it's out there, but I just uh, haven't seen it. Now, uh, on to some other forms of uh, edema. Um, this patient was sent in by a certified lymphedema therapist because their swelling was not improving with complete lymphatic decongestive therapy, the, the standard care for, uh, for lymphedema. Why wasn't their swelling getting any better? And you're probably wondering, what in the heck is taped all over this patient's leg? Well, these are kinesio, uh, kinesio tape or kinesio strip that, uh, strips that they use when they're doing the massage therapy or complex uh, lymphedema therapy. So why isn't their lymphedema getting any better with compression? Now, what you see here or don't see is you don't see any foot or toe swelling, right? I mean, you see just abrupt termination of the swelling right at the level of the ankle. I mean, there is no swelling there whatsoever. So with the sparing of the foot uh, and the toes is actually characteristic of the lipohypertrophy lipedema. Well, here's some salient features of lipedema. In lipedema, these patients have grossly enlarged fatty buttocks, thighs, and calves, and the swelling abruptly stops at the ankle. We'll call this the ankle cutoff sign or the ankle cuff sign. So you can see here that swelling abruptly terminates at the level of the ankle. Uh, the swelling in lipedema tends to be bilateral and symmetrical, and that's in contrast to the lymphedema patient. You think of all the limbs I've already shown you, uh, whether or not it's secondary lymphedema from our morbid obesity, or I showed you a primary lymphedema patient with the Noonan syndrome, there still was asymmetry as far as the swelling goes. So you hardly ever see symmetrically, uh, uh, you hardly ever see symmetric lymphedema, be it uh, primary or secondary. But in lipedema, because this is nothing more than a, uh, an unusual fatty deposition syndrome, it tends to be symmetric. Also, sometimes you'll see what's called the fat pad sign. You'll see a little protuberance of fat just anterior to the lateral malleoli. 
Hey, what's unique about the lipedema patients is their, their torsos are relatively normal. That is, you don't have swelling in the torso or the upper extremity. So these patients look like a pear, if you will. Uh, because this is uh, uh, an unusual fat deposition, it's non-pitting. It's very, very tender for indeterminate reasons. And it's frequently misdiagnosed as lymphedema, uh, like it was in this patient. Uh, but it shouldn't be because, again, there's, a, there's no swelling in the, the feet or toes in this patient. And they don't have a proximal lymph node obstruction. And again, they have this peculiar phenomenon of sparing of the trunk. So sometimes you'll say that their trunk and their lower extremities don't match. They don't match at all. You've got these big legs and you've got this small little waist. This was actually identified by Allen and Hines in 1940 and coined the painful fat syndrome because for indeterminate reasons, uh, they have chronic pain, uh, they're quite tender. It's almost exclusively in women. There have only been three to four cases ever reported in males. It's heritable. Uh, it tends to present in puberty to early 20s. So what also presents in puberty to early 20s that we talked about? Primary lymphedema, which we've referred to as lymphedema precox, typically comes on at the same time, which further confuses this entity with lymphedema. But yet, if you were to see this patient, look, we've got symmetric swelling. You see the abrupt termination of the swelling at the level of the ankles. This is not lymphedema. This is lipedema. Uh, because this is a fat, the swelling persists despite elevation, compression, weight loss, diuretics. Uh, you can do all the traditional measures you would use to treat a swollen limb, and they don't get better. The only way you're really going to make them better is with uh, suction lipectomy, but unfortunately, uh, insurance is not going to pay for this procedure, typically, as they consider it uh, cosmetic, so these patients go untreated. And it's really sad because, uh, like this next patient I'm going to show you, oh, by the way, here's the ankle cuff sign again, and also you can see that little fat pad that's anterior to the lateral malleus. Here was this poor woman that I saw a couple of months ago. Here's her photograph. So what do you see on this photograph? You see these symmetrically enlarged uh, undulations of, of fatty tissue along the legs, but look at this mismatch between her torso and her lower extremities. They don't match. This is classic for what you see in lipedema, the mismatch. And it was very frustrating because this poor woman used to weigh in her 400s, in her 400 uh, pounds, and she underwent the gastric bypass surgery. Where did she lose her weight? She lost it on the trunk, her upper extremities, but her legs never changed. She was despondent, and that's very characteristic of lipedema. It's frustrating because um, plastic surgeons will see these patients and they just say, well, you need to lose weight. I'm not going to do any liposuction on you. And they can lose weight, but as seen here in this photograph, it's not going to help. That's, that's characteristic of lipedema. Lipedema, there are certainly a different stages of lymphedema. Early on, as seen here on the left, you just have what a lot of people will call cankles. Notice the swelling, relatively symmetric, but look how it abruptly terminates the ankles. And then so that's a stage one uh, lipedema. And then here all the way to a stage three, which is the worst type, where you actually get these these massive undulations of, uh, of fatty tissue. Let me go back there again. Look at those feet. Those feet are not swollen. And I guarantee you people will see this. And I get these all the time in my clinic. They'll say, you know, refer the patient for so-called lymphedema. It's not lymphedema. That's lipedema. It's, it's uh, fatty tissue. There's no cutaneous fibrosis here, and it, and it spares the, uh, the feet. So that's stage 3 lipedema. And I like this quote, lipedema is not rare, but the diagnosis is rarely made. It's been estimated that about uh, uh, one in five patients that are referred to lymphedema clinics uh, actually have lipedema. So what's going on here? How would you explain this? And this is an in increasing problem in the United States. I see these in my clinic. I probably see one of these a month now. I'll give you a posterior view. What do you think's going on here? You can see she has to wear, um, she's got to wear these, um, these sandals or flip-flops, whatever you want to call them, house shoes, because her feet do swell a little bit. But it's but when you compare the amount of swelling in her feet with her thighs, there's clear discordance here. So most of her swelling is up in her thighs. I mean, look at that pendulated appearing mass there on the on the right side. What is this? Anybody? Is this lymphedema? Well, this is actually a variant of lymphedema called massive localized lymphedema, or NLL. Uh, MLL. We'll also refer to these as pseudotumors or pseudosarcomas. 
and these are being increased. Now, I mean, look at this picture. Is that not unbelievable, this, this lateral photo here? I mean, that's unbelievable. And, and not surprised this patient was functionally impaired uh, because every time she'd walk, these, these giant pseudotumors would encroach on one another. Uh, here's recent uh, data from Brewer 2011, who had actually looked at the, uh, the literature on these. Uh, 41 patients have been reported. The average weight is 421 pounds. So back to this, uh, this link between morbid obesity and lymphedema. Uh, it, it looms large, uh, if you will. Here's a case I saw not too long ago. You might think this is a massive localized lymphedema of the pelvis. Believe it or not, this was actually emanating from the proximal medial right thigh. It looks like it's in the midline, but it's actually coming from the medial right thigh. And you can certainly see a lot of cobblestoning on that. I mean, that's, uh, that's an unbelievable case. So again, you don't see this in non-obese patients. It's in the morbidly obese patient. Now let's go through the concept of multifactorial etiology. Uh, what, back to our, our teaching, we're all taught you like to, to neatly characterize patients with lower extremity lymphedema as having either, well, you've got chronic venous insufficiency, looks like you have lymphedema, this patient probably has chronic venous insufficiency. But what you have to keep in mind, especially when we're dealing with the morbidly obese patient, is you can have hybrid edemas, if you will, um, due to multiple problems. And here's a great example. This was a lady, had a family history of the following lower extremity swelling, began in her early 20s, and in her early 20s, she had no foot or toe swelling. And if you were to look at these thighs and calves, and you just see, again, these undulations of fatty tissue that a lot of times we'll call the mattress phenomenon. I mean, that's not characteristic of, uh, of lymphedema. That's what you'll see in patients with uh, fatty appearing legs or lipedema. And by the way, she had a mismatch between her torso and her legs. She had classic lipedema. However, she comes in and says she's in her 60s now, and she says that over the last five years or so, also, you, you, this skin we'll refer to as a walnut appearance, mattress phenomena walnut appearance. We just look at the, the fatty appearing skin. So she comes in and she says that over the last five years, this is stage two lipedema, that now she could, she's having a hard time wearing shoes. So at the outset, she'll tell you, oh, yeah, I never had a hard time wearing shoes at all until the last five years. So now that we see foot swelling, that suggests we have lymphedema. So what can happen in patients that have long-standing lipedema that are actually overweight, about half the patients with lipedema are overweight, they can actually eventuate and develop a secondary lymphedema. So you can get what we call lipolymphedema. It's a combination of both of these entities. So things aren't always straightforward when it comes to lower extremity swelling. What about this patient? If you were to see them in your clinic, uh, what's causing their swelling? So based on what we've talked about, does this patient have lymphedema? And hopefully you're going to say yes, because you recognize the swelling in the dorsal feet. You recognize the swelling in the toes. Look at the exaggerated skin creases. All classic manifestations of lymphedema. Also look over on the left leg. You see the verrucous appearing down on the distal calf, suggestive of early elephantiasis, the deep fissures. So the patient has elephantiasis, but when you think of all these extremities we've looked at with lymphedema, you did not see this particular shape. There's something unusual about the shape here of these legs. It's not characteristic of garden variety lymphedema, if you will. So what other entity does this patient have? You'll also notice we see some hyperpigmentation. Yeah, very good, CVI, absolutely. So this patient actually has flebo lymphedema. He's got a combination of both chronic venous insufficiency and secondary lymphedema. This was actually one of the subjects in our study. And uh, when you see this particular clinical appearance where you see this discordance between proximal calf swelling and yet relative atrophy, well, actually, it's not relative. It is atrophy that occurs down in the distal calves. We call this the inverted champagne bottle, inverted bowling pin appearance. And that didn't just happen overnight. I mean, that's longstanding chronic venous hypertension that's led to atrophy within the uh, subcutaneous uh, tissues, and you get this uh, peculiar uh, concavity along the, uh, the, the calves. And uh, so when you see this, this patient clearly has flebo lymphedema. Again, 71% of the patients in our series had both of these, uh, these problems. Here's a great test question for you. And you think of all, and just keep in mind all the things we've talked about so far. What is the cause of this patient's swelling? One, lipedema. Wow, people are waiting. Okay, good. We have an astute audience here. Uh, it's clearly all of the above. And let's go through all of the above. First of all, We've got some big-time legs here. I mean, these are big, but yet look at her 
trunk. Look at her waist. It's relatively small. So we've got the mismatch between the trunk and the lower extremity suggestive of lipedema. That's also suggested by these undulations of fatty tissue, sort of a mattress appearance to her legs. But look, then you have to account for why does she have swelling in her feet? Why does she have on the left distal medial thigh this huge protuberance that you can see is discolored? That's actually a pseudotumor. So she has signs of lymphedema as well. And then finally, what do you see down in the calves that's not characteristic of classic lymphedema? Well, we see discoloration in the gator distribution that suggests chronic venous insufficiency. So this patient actually has all of the above. So again, you can't always neatly pigeonhole edemas into saying, oh, this is definitely, a, this is this chronic venous insufficiency. These patients, especially the large patients, can have various combinations of all of these uh, um, pathologies. But what a, uh, what a photo. That's a patient of mine I saw uh, last year. So good job on uh, quickly identifying all of the above. Now, we're going to end here on treatment, and uh, I know Kavi said in the interest of time we wanted to go around uh, 50 minutes, so I, let me, uh, it looks like we're almost at about uh, 52. I won't go any longer than an hour, Kavi, we're just going to blaze through this treatment. Uh, the majority of patients with lymphedema are treated with a conservative non-surgical or medical approach. Uh, I think this is an interesting uh, statement from the International Society of Lymph uh, Lymphedema Consensus document in 2009. No treatment method has really undergone a satisfactory meta-analysis, let alone rigorous, randomized, stratified, long-term controlled studies. We just don't have good data out there, especially with lower extremity lymphedema on how to treat it. There's, there's a lot of, there's surprisingly a lot, uh, pretty good data for the upper extremity, but lower extremity, uh, um, not, uh, not so much. And you always have to remind your patients there is no known cure for lymphedema. Now, the international gold standard, if you will, for treating lymphedema is called CDT, or Complete Decongestive Therapy. Sometimes you'll see this as Comprehensive Lymphedema Management. Sometimes you'll see Complete Lymphatic Decongestive Therapy. This is the so-called gold standard. It involves the following five steps. Good skin care, manual lymphatic drainage performed by a certified lymphedema uh, therapist. This is a... Uh, a, uh, a, a, a Massage therapy that's performed by a professionally trained therapist. And sometimes you'll use intermittent pneumatic uh, compression pumps as well. That's followed by application of these complex low stretch wraps. These aren't ace bandages. These are very short stretch wraps. An exercise program, and then you're going to fit them with a the compression garment. And in the interest of time, we're just going to move right to manual lymphatic drainage. This is an ideal setting. You've got uh, somebody doing massage therapy on a an arm that doesn't look like they have much lymphedema there to me, but uh, the idea behind manual lymphatic drainage is you're moving lymph from dysfunctional to healthy areas through a massage uh, technique. It's thought to enhance filling of the initial or the terminal small cutaneous lymphatics. It's thought to increase lymphatic contractility and even facilitate regeneration of superficial lymphatic vessels and uh, with direct pressure actually degrade cutaneous and subcutaneous fibrosis. And then the last step that we, uh, we talked about is uh, uh, you'd like to get these patients fit with a gradient compression garment. Uh, the problem I have with that is here's the, the typical patient they show you in the ads. You've got these uh, nice thin legs, but yet this is real life. This is what I see in my clinic every day, and then it begets the question, what in the heck am I going to do as far as trying to put a gradient compression stocking on legs that look like that? Do you think that's going to work? No, it's not real life. Gradient compression stockings don't work when you have somebody that has legs that look like that. I, I, I liken this trying to put a, a square peg in a round hole. It's not going to fit. So what are you going to do? Well, it's actually nice now. Uh, you've got these alternative compression devices out there that all are based on uh, uh, the use of Velcro wraps. They have various names, Comprofit, uh, Ferro wraps, Circade wraps. And you can see here that these, these wraps are segmental, and so you can adjust these to the, uh, the, uh, the shape of these disfigured uh, limbs. So they're, they're very, very helpful uh, when you get these big limbs uh, uh, that, uh, that have lymphedema. So back to complete decongestive therapy, which like we talked about is the gold standard. It's broken down into two treatment phases. Phase one, which is what you order. You say, I want this patient seen uh, in a clinic-based setting here at Ohio State. We actually have a, a, a big lymphedema clinic, and you send them in in a, a professional, a certified lymphedema therapist. It's undergone 124 hours of training, administers this therapy. Uh, and then, in an ideal world, they teach the patients or their caregivers 
that when they return home that they're supposed to do the same massage therapy. And uh, that's where things uh, break down. It's just not real life to expect a patient or their caregiver to perform self-massage therapy with the same efficiency as a professional. It just doesn't work. I mean, can you imagine that you're going to teach this guy right here to massage his leg all the way down his foot? He can't even get a shoe on. So uh, it's just not realistic to expect that phase one uh, CLT or certified lymphedema therapy performed in a clinic can uh, occur with equal efficiency at home just doesn't work that way. It's also very, very time consuming. It's physically demanding, requires expertise, and availability is a problem as well. If you're at a big major medical center, you'll have certified lymphedema therapists, but if you're out in a, a smaller community, uh, they don't exist. So a lot of limitations of uh, trying to teach patients to do this at home. Again, here's ideal settings. We have small limbs. Uh, this is how they're uh, typically massaged and wrapped, but uh, what about this patient when they go home? What about this elderly guy? You think he's going to be able to do it or his wife? I don't think so. And uh, good luck uh, uh, getting this patient to perform a self-MLD. So wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, certified lymphedema therapy, although advertised as the international gold standard, it's not uh, necessarily effective when the patients go home. And insurance will eventually stop paying for that, uh, that therapy. They'll pay for a month or two, and then they're going to cut it off. So what are you going to do when they go home? Well, we have pneumatic compression pumps that you can use. A couple of problems you have to keep in mind if you order a simple pneumatic pump. You write your prescription, pneumatic pump. There are problems with older pumps, and that's specifically displacing edema to the proximal portion of the limb, uh, which over time can actually lead to uh, uh, sclerosis or fibrosis at the proximal portion of the limb. And this is really a problem in patients that have had some type of proximal lymph node obstruction. The patient that's undergone post gynecologic surgery or a mastectomy, I mean, you think about it. They're obstructed in their axilla. They're obstructed in their hemi-inguinal region. If you put a pump below that region, you're going to mobilize all the fluid right up to that obstruction. So it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, physiologically. Uh, you can exacerbate swelling not only in the, uh, uh, the pelvis or the arm, but up into the trunk, uh, the abdomen. Uh, you can get genital edema with uh, a traditional pump if you use it in the setting of proximal lymph node obstruction. I have no problem with using a traditional pump for somebody that has the garden variety obesity and chronic venous insufficiency associated lymphedema. There's no problem there. But if you had somebody that's had a, uh, a proximal lymph node surgery, I would liken this to running into a brick wall. And uh, we're almost done here. I'm just going to break here for a second and show you a clip of how uh, some of the newer pumps on the market actually work. And these are designed to mimic the certified lymphedema therapy that's performed in a clinic. So you can see here, they're actually starting to mobilize and prepare. This is a preparatory phase. They're preparing the proximal area first before it actually drains. And so the idea is that you're you're uh, activating these uh, these remaining cutaneous lymphatics. You're uh, lowering the hydrostatic pressure and allowing it to receive uh, lymph fluid from the lower portion of the limb. So you prepare approximately. Oh, the video's not showing. That's, un I wonder why that's not showing. Well, darn, I'm just going to get right out of this. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what to do. But anyway, let me just go back to the, uh, the talk here in the interest of the time. That's unfortunate. Uh, let me just show you some pictures. This will be a little bit easier to, to to uh, visualize. Um, here are some of the newer pumps that are on the market, like I talked about. Here's the, the Flexi Touch. Here's the uh, Lymphopress Optimal model. And you can see here that they actually have a sleeve that's all the way up on the trunk in the pelvis. And so that actually sequences first. It decongests the proximal regions, and then you start your traditional sequencing from the distal portion of the limb. So again, this, these pumps are designed to mimic the uh, the uh, the art of certified lymphedema therapists or manual lymphatic drainage is per, it's uh, performed. Finally, from a surgical standpoint, you have excisional or debulking procedures are performed uh, or physiologic surgeries. Uh, unless you're at a highly specialized uh, tertiary care facility, it's going to be very unlikely you have anybody doing physiologic surgery. We've got two plastic surgeons at Ohio State that are currently undergoing training on uh, some of these microsurgical techniques over in Spain, and our di idea is that we're going to start to doing this before long, but uh, certainly these are limited just to a few uh, centers. Um, here's a barbaric uh, excisional procedure called the Charles procedure, where they actually go in and strip off not just the skin, but the subcutaneous tissues as well. <laughs> that looks, uh, let's just say, disfiguring. 
Um, you, I, I haven't seen that done uh, in gosh, that, but That's a picture that's about uh, 18 years old. I don't see that done anymore. Now, here's a patient we showed you with the MLL, or Massive Localized Lymphedema, from our institution. Saw one of the plastic surgeons. They simply removed that entire mass, and you can see that's the end result. This patient was elated, absolutely elated. So, so what if she has a big scar? She can now walk. And finally, it's interesting because you have this argument that, uh, well, what should I use? What kind of pump? What kind of pressure? How long should I pump them? Uh, maybe they need concurrent chronic lymphedema therapy. It doesn't matter unless you lose weight. Weight loss is by far the most important a treatment element to these uh, morbidly obese patients anyway. And then even your secondary uh, uh, lymphedema patients, if they gain weight, they're going to have problems with their lymphedema. So you need to... Uh, need to lose weight. So we're going to wrap things up here. We're at about uh, 61 minutes. Following conclusions, secondary lymphedema often develops in the setting of primary occult lymphedema. There are new classification schemes out there for primary lymphedema that are not so simplistic and recognize specific phenotypes that you see in the primary lymphedema patient. Morbid obesity may be the biggest, if you will, cause of secondary lower extreme lymphedema. Cellulitis is more often a marker rather than a cause of lymphedema. We've clearly seen that lymphedema can coexist with both chronic venous insufficiency and lipedema, these so-called hybrid edemas. And finally, novel lymphatic pumps have changed the treatment paradigm for lymphedema, which actually mimic uh, the art of certified lymphedema therapy. And let's put it all together with a, a case here. Uh, we'll terminate on this. This was a 42-year-old woman I saw a couple of years ago with a two-year history of progressive painless right foot and distal calf swelling. She clearly had lymphedema on examination. She had been evaluated by multiple physicians in the area, had every test you can imagine for her right leg swelling, and uh, and they were all negative, but everybody that saw her, the vascular physician, said, you clearly have lymphedema. Well, this was a learned woman. She went and read on the, uh, the Internet, and she read that anybody that develops lymphedema after the age of 40, you've got to be concerned about a tumor. It's, it's secondary. You've got to be concerned about secondary lymphedema from a tumor in any patient. I mean, we were all taught that. Yet her workup was normal, but she was terrified. What was interesting, in her history, I actually picked up that her mother had post-mastectomy lymphedema. And so, you know, with your current, with uh, your uh, previous thinking, you're probably saying, well, yeah, she had, she had a mastectomy. Why didn't she have secondary lymphedema? But knowing what we know now about some of these genetic mutations that can underlie both primary and even secondary lymphedema, I was suspicious that she had primary lymphedema that suddenly became manifest at the age of uh, 40. So in order to allay her fears, what did I do? Uh, I think I had Kavi actually do a lymphocentigram on this patient, and this was quite illustrative. But you can see here in the right leg, there are no lymphatics, and you see a little bit of dermal, uh, uh, dermal backflow here on the, on the top of the foot, but she has no lymphatics. So again, here's an example of a lady that lived her 40 years without any lymphedema, and suddenly one day that, that remaining lymphatic vessel suddenly gave out and she had clinically manifest lymphedema. So uh, anyway, that really kind of puts everything together as far as what we talked about. And uh, I appreciate your attention. I know this is something I don't know how, how relevant it is for a lot of your practices because I know you're going to be uh, doing uh, radiology type procedures, but uh, it, maybe some of these uh, these concepts will, will help you out at, uh, at some point. So what do we do now? Are we any questions or anything, or how does this work? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That was a, that was a great talk. And, you know, for, for a lot of us, you know, as we go into fellowship and uh, we're in clinic a lot, uh, distinguishing uh, lymphedema from venous insufficiency and PAD is, is going to be very helpful for us. So it was a great talk, very relevant. And if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to ask at this time, please. Oh, thank you. I appreciate all the comments. We greatly appreciate these. Uh, you know, Dr. Dean, I did have one question. Uh, yeah. For, you know, for a patient actually with, uh, like, venous, chronic venous occlusion, uh, more centrally either in the pelvis, or lower abdomen or pelvis, um, you know, I, I know you mentioned chronic venous, venous insufficiency coexisting with lymphedema. Do you ever see improvement of symptoms after recanalization of the central veins? With pelvic oh, veins sure. Yeah, the, the classic example would be uh, the patient with May Thurner syndrome or uh, chronic left iliac vein uh, stenosis or occlusion. Uh, they obviously have swelling related to their venous obstruction, yet it has been shown, and with studies where they've looked at that at May Thurner phenomenon, they've done lymphocentigrams on them, they have concurrent chronic venous insufficiency as well. Actually, a majority of them do. And it has been shown, uh, there's a guy out of Mississippi, he's the guy that's done all the work on this, that uh, they fixed their, uh, their iliac vein occlusion, and both their venous and lymphatic mediated swelling improves. 
uh, and, and they even have follow-up lymphocentigrams on these patients that did show improvement. So that's the classic example I can I can think of that where you see the relation between the two uh, two uh, systems. Okay, fantastic. I think there was another question typed in as well. Uh, will lympho and lipedema resolve if uh, liposuction is done? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The the, the lipedema part will uh, will improve, but again, the big problem is. As you can imagine, insurance companies consider suction lipectomy to be a cosmetic procedure. So uh, you hardly ever have any approval for this, and patients aren't willing to pay out of pocket. Um, so you just don't see this done in the U.S. much. I mean, if you go into the uh, the European literature, they have an abundance of literature on a, a pretty good good series, uh, sizes of 25, 40 patients with lipedema. They all undergo suction lipectomy, and they are just elated with results. But it just doesn't happen very often in the United States. And also, the plastic surgeons, uh, usually they're very skilled at doing uh, uh, suction lipectomy up in the thighs, uh, so-called thigh and thigh plasties, but down in the calf, they just don't have typically a lot of training in, in mod remodeling the calves. So uh, that's frustrating. And then what's really frustrating is I've sent these patients in for consideration, and what do they say? Well, the patient needs to lose weight. They have no idea that these patients have classic lipidema, and I just pull my hair out when that's scenario. I just, so it's, it's, it, the patients are frustrating. It's a very frustrating condition uh, to deal with because, again, you can lose weight, but it's, it's typically not going to help too much. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Any, uh, any other questions? Hey, again, everybody, I appreciate all the nice comments. I'm glad you uh, tuned in tonight. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dean. That was a great talk, and uh, we look forward to. If it's okay with you, we'd like to have you back again next year and, uh, and discuss this topic some more. That was that was fantastic. So. Okay, great. Yeah, well, I uh, always have plenty of good pictures, and uh, we can go over whatever you need from, from pictorial standpoint, ulcers or different types of swelling, venous disease, whatever. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you again. Thanks to everybody who uh, kind of tuned in, and uh, and that was a great talk, and uh, and we'll see everybody soon. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Take care, Kavi. You too, you too. Bye-bye.